All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Steffi Morrison. I'm the programs coordinator at Arts Fund. I use she, her pronouns, and I identify as a mixed race Asian American woman. I have brown hair, and today I'm wearing a dark blue top against a white background. As we begin today's event, I would like to acknowledge that the city of Seattle, where Arts Fund is based, is on the occupied lands of the Coast Salish people, specifically the ancestral land of the Duwamish, Stiligwamish, Muckleshoot, and Squamish tribes, who have stewarded this land throughout the generation. I would also like to acknowledge that many with us today are on different lands, and we join you in honoring and recognizing those as well. Today, we are joined by two ASL interpreters who will be switching on and off screen approximately every 15 to 20 minutes. This event will be recorded and posted to our website in the coming days. At any point in the program, please use the chat feature to ask questions so that our staff can keep track of any new topics. And during the Q&A section of the program, we will invite you to come on screen to ask those questions. Arts Fund would like to thank Warner Media for being the sponsor of this Cultural Partners Network event. And now I would like to welcome Sarah Sidman for some context and framing behind today's gathering. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Sarah Sidman, and I am Arts Fund's Vice President of Strategic Initiatives and Communications. Uh, I am a light-skinned white woman with long brown hair, wearing dark clothing, sitting in my basement uh, in front of some brightly colored art. And it is great to be among you this morning for today's convening of the Cultural Partners Network. Arts Fund's Cultural Partners are a network of Arts Fund affiliated arts and cultural organizations of the Central Puget Sound region. Through convenings like this one, events, and communications. The goal is to deepen ties between organizations, provide capacity building, and generate exposure to new audiences and donors. We formed the CPN in 2015 as we sunset a three-year crowdfunding program called Power to Give, as a means for the Power to Give groups to stay connected to one another and to Arts Fund. We recognize the value our cultural partners add to one another and to our programming and impact. Relationship with the Cultural Partners Network, now over 130 members strong, is at the heart of what we do, and we thank you all for joining us today. We come together this morning to collectively examine how staff and board members of cultural organizations can leverage Arts Fund's COVID cultural impact study as a useful advocacy, planning, and fundraising tool. For today's program, we are honored to be joined by leaders from the Studies Advisory Committee, as well as by the study's lead author and by our partners at Inspire Washington. And we are in the expert hands of Steffi Morrison. As we write in the report, we are not nearing the tail end of a pandemic. We are at the beginning of a structural transformation. As you all know all too well, the pandemic had immediate, significant, and devastating impacts upon the sector, its workforce, and the communities it serves. And as we near the start of year three since the shutdowns, these impacts continue. But we have had enough time and we have enough data to identify key trends and to inform decisions moving forward. How has the pandemic affected models of creating, consuming, and supporting arts and culture? How have participants reacted? And what are they anticipating moving forward? What does the broader public think about the role arts and culture will play in our community's recovery? There is a transformation afoot. We've also been saying the future was delivered to us overnight, but we can't change overnight. That said, the, pan the pivots that artists and cultural organizations made in quick response to the pandemic have been nothing short of monumental. Today, we hold this time as one space in which we can collectively discuss and define the next steps in the transformation. Building out of the experiences of the last two years and supported by this new data, where do we go from here? Thank you for joining with us and one another today to tackle this question. I now turn the program back to Steffi, who will lay the foundation for today's conversations with a dive into the findings themselves. Thank you, Sarah. So since April of 2020, Arts Fund has been tracking the impacts 
from the pandemic on nonprofit cultural organizations through its quarterly data snapshot projects. And since spring of 2021, ArtsFund began the COVID Cultural Impact Study, which is a comprehensive research initiative aimed to analyze the depth of the challenges the pandemic has created for the sector and to eliminate the support necessary for its recovery and reimagination. The CCIS was conducted with research collaborators and guided by a cross-sector advisory committee, as well as Arts Fund's policy and board committee. Data collection was completed in early fall of 2021 that used several key data sources. The first of which is, was the nonprofit organizational survey with 212 survey respondents from across Washington state and 121 of which reported three years of financial data. The second source was a cultural participant survey of 737 adults who had attended at least one cultural program since the beginning of the pandemic, which we marked as March, 2020. And then lastly was a statewide omnibus poll, which was a sample of 874 adults representative of Washington residents. And that omnibus poll used the same questions as the cultural participant survey. In the report, data was disaggregated in multiple ways, including by regions in Washington based on groupings of counties as seen on the map here, by organizational size, and by Black, Indigenous, and other people of color identity. So BIPOC identity was self-reported by organizations who chose that they were led by majority BIPOC staff and leadership, or had majority BIPOC board, and or those that primarily serve BIPOC communities. Organizations in Arts Fund's Cultural Partners Network accounted for over 50% of our organizational respondents. So we just really wanted to thank you for your engagement and your participation. So to begin, I wanna start with some of the significant financial impacts um, we found through this report. Among the 121 organizations who shared those three years of financial data, there was almost a quarter decline in total revenue in the first year of the pandemic. This equates to almost $100 million loss in the sector. But we also know that this does not fully account for the total losses across the state. For Central Puget Sound organizations in particular, they experienced a 35% decrease in earned revenue and a 10% increase in contributed revenue between fiscal years 19 and 20. While the total losses were offset by increases to contributed revenue between the first year of the pandemic, be it through individual donations and public and private pandemic relief funds, those funds are projected to decline in fiscal year 21. And whether due to fewer available programs or household budget constraints, at the time of data collection, cultural participants expect, expected to spend half, half of what they spent prior to March 2020 on cultural participation. And by cultural participation, we included expenditures on tickets, related uh, merchandise, food and beverages, cost of childcare, transportation to parking and lodging and more. However, cultural participants also reported donating to more organizations, 41%, and donated more funds per organizations during this period of time. So while the financial losses were dire across the sector, the impacts have been more severe for BIPOC identifying organizations. While these organizations did see a 29% increase in contributed income between fiscal years 19 and 20, it is on a sharp decline with a projected 50% decrease in fiscal year 21. And as you can see on the graph here, that, that shows um, a number that is below fiscal 19 baseline numbers. Pandemic relief funding was critical in the survival of many of these organizations. We found that 93% were able to access some type of pandemic relief fund 
And of those accessed, the top three sources came from public support. However, access to funds varied by organizational size, with the smaller ones typically being the least likely to access relief funds. And this trend was most pronounced with federal programs such as the PPP, the Shredded Venues Operator Grant, and the Employee Retention Credit. And those offered the highest amount of a relief, relief funds. Smaller organizations that did access relief funds access fewer sources on average. It's likely that these smaller organizations rely on volunteers to keep their organizations running, and many were unable to take advantage of federal relief due to program guidelines or sheer issues of capacity. And while pandemic relief and increased contributed revenue did offset some of the financial impacts, many organizations still had to resort to major operating budget cuts or spend down their operating reserves to withstand the loss of earned revenue. At the time of data collection, 33% of organizations reported having already spent down their operating reserves. And of course, not all organizations entered the pandemic with significant operating reserves to begin with. So in addition to spending down these reserves, many groups had to implement other cost-saving survival strategies, including the closing of facilities and enacting furloughs and layoffs to staff. Of the responding organizations, 41% furloughed full-time staff or reduced hours in pay across the organization. And based off of our earlier snapshots, we know that it was the contract and seasonal workers that were most impacted early on. And that this percentage does not capture the loss of volunteers or interns. Across the organizations that provided their budget histories, there was a decline in volunteers of over 8,000 individuals. This prolonged period of economic uncertainty placed many in difficult situations to the degree that some have exited their occupation and the sector prompting a concern of a cultural brain drain. At the time of data collection, of the organizations that had opened in a full or limited capacity, 41% reported concern about hiring and rehiring staff. Prior to March of 2020, so pre-pandemic, Participants in, our, in this survey were highly engaged with events, programs, and activities, with 76% reporting a frequency of attending monthly or even more often. However, from March 2020 to the time of data collection in August of 21, only 28% reported that they were consuming at that same frequency. When we asked, what have been the reasons why they participated in a cultural program since March of 2020, these were the top reasons. To experience art, it brought them joy, and to support a community organization or program. And when they were asked about how they decided whether to participate in person when available, the most imp important factors that people were considering at the time were around mask and safety policies and vaccination status. At the time of the survey, 38% of cultural participants indicated that they had already returned to in-person engagement. But as we can see from the pie chart, most, most reported holding off or are unsure or waiting to see. And I mentioned this statewide omnibus or public opinion poll earlier. So that really sought to understand how the public more broadly conceives of, conceives of and prioritizes arts and culture. And when they were asked that same question, how they decided whether to participate in person when available, the most important factors to them were about the content of the program, again, the mask and safety policies, and the affordability of ticket and admission pricing. So, we are seeing now that even when in-person programming picks back up, 16% of statewide poll respondents 
want to maintain online participation regardless of the availability of in-person programs. So while it's been a challenging pivot, many noted that this shift to online participation came with its own silver linings that included greater geographic reach and greater inclusivity for participants. This shift to virtual programming has increased access for certain participants, including those with physical disabilities or impairments and transportation challenges or other barriers to leaving home. Across the surveyed organizations, nearly one third had made accessibility improvements and another 22% said they plan to. And that 84% of those making that shift intend to make it permanent. Moving towards equity in this realm will require significant investment and continued consideration because anecdotally, communities that lack reliable and affordable internet access, devices and technology literacy were much more likely to be isolated from cultural offerings over the past two years. So the upheaval caused by the pandemic has made the essential role of arts and culture more expansive and urgent. But at the same time, these providers are feeling the most resource constrained and exhausted from years of operating in this limbo. During this time, many organizations have adapted their programming and made changes to their core, and core mission and organizational structure. And one fifth or 20% have updated their mission statements and another 16% plan to do so. It also appears that the future of arts organizations looks to be more networked. 42% reported increases, increases in activity that were conducted with local partnerships. And that 94% of those felt like this was a permanent shift. Qualitative results indicate that organizations see partnerships as central to rebuilding and that this thinking includes partnerships that go across sectors as well. According to cultural participants, nonprofit organizations will play an important role in post pandemic recovery. And some of the top most identified roles included here, economic recovery for businesses, encouraging community unity and vitality, providing entertainment, offering hope, and creating employment for individuals. And that a staggering 99% of cultural participants in this study reported that they value cultural programming more or at the same amount as they did pre-pandemic. So with the high level of value placed on cultural programming, with the high level of importance that they place on organizations in the role in recovery, this really is an opportunity to engage and support the sector as a key actor in the near and long term. So Arts Fund recommendations focused on five uh, key areas highlighted for different stakeholder groups. And these stakeholders include government and policymakers, cultural organizations, private funders, corporations and corporate funders, individuals, and partner sectors. The upcoming panel discussion will highlight the following recommendations. To reimagine the role of arts and culture in our communities, to expand and sustain public support, to protect the cultural workforce, to focus on equity, and to support the long-term adaptation of the industry. So I, now I would like to welcome Kate Becker, who will lead the discussion between our panelists, Amy Chasanov, Nina Yarbro, David Fisher. And as a reminder, please use the chat to ask questions so that our staff, staff can keep track of topics. During the Q&A, we will invite you to join us on screen. So with that, I welcome Kate. Thank you so very much, Steffi, and I am delighted to be here with all of you today and our esteemed panelists. My name is Kate Becker. I am the Creative Economy and Recovery Director in King County Executive Dow Constantine's office. I use she, her pronouns, and I am a white woman and I am wearing, I have red hair and glasses, and I'm wearing a multicolored blue and orange top. 
So thank you for having me. I'm really grateful to be here. And here are our panelists. And uh, can you all please introduce yourself? Uh, Amy, would you start with an introduction? Sure, I'm happy to be here with everybody today. My name is Amy Chazanoff. I'm the Foundation and Government Relations Strategist at the Fifth Avenue Theater, and I'm also on the board of Seattle Children's Theater. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a middle-aged white woman with short, dark hair um, in a black turtleneck and sitting in front of a burgundy credenza with a little kid's art on the side. Thanks, Amy. Nina. Thanks, Kate. Good morning, everyone. My name is Nina Yarbrough. I use she, her pronouns. I am the arts program director for For Culture. Uh, I am uh, a brown skin, black American woman with curly, curly black hair. I'm wearing pink headphones a plum blazer with a yellow necklace and I'm sitting in my living room uh, with a blurred background because life is crazy and my living room is a mess. Excellent, thank you. And David, welcome. Thank you, Kate. Good morning, everyone. My name is David Fisher. I'm executive director at Tacoma Arts Live. I use he, him pronouns. I am a late middle age, although I'm still hanging on to that middle age moniker as long as I can, white man uh, with glasses, a uh, more salt than pepper beard and an ever receding forehead. So that's me in Tacoma, Washington. Thank you. Thanks for being with us, all of you. I'm excited about the conversation we're going to have and uh, we're gonna jump right in to it. Um, all of you have worked so hard to navigate these stormy waters we've been in, and uh, we never want to find ourselves in this vulnerable position again in the cultural sector. So we're going to jump right in with this question for all of our panelists. What long-term changes can the sector make to protect against future shocks? What do you think there, panelists? How are we going to, to um, you know, brace ourselves so that when future shocks come, which they will, how are we going to be more ready for it? I think we have to keep the nimble, uh, flexible structures that we have adopted uh, during the past two years as not just a temporary structure, but an ongoing one. We have to be reading the data as it's coming and continually challenging ourselves to interpret that data and pivot as much and as often as we can. The downside, of course, is the exhausting nature of that pivot. So that's the challenge. Thank you. I, I would add that there, I think, needs to be an, a reevaluation of our organizational cultures. Um, many organizations found themselves in pretty precarious situations, whether it be around employee retention or responding to the many social uh, uprises that happened during uh, the summer of 2020. And I think having like just intentional conversations around what has to happen within institutions and groups in order to be in line with I guess the moral compass that people are are very aware of, um, and you can't ignore it. Like the whether you're talking about the Black Lives Matter movement, whether you are talking about uh, recognizing how the detrimental impact we have all had to the planet, um, ignoring all of those because we're in arts and culture is is not an option. I, just to piggyback on that a little bit, I think figuring out ways to be relevant to the broader community in ways that maybe we haven't been before. And I think, um, at least for the organizations that I'm close to, a lot of that is investing in youth, um, investing in youth arts, because really, that's our future. Those are the future artists and the future uh, audiences and consumers for what we do. So making sure that our the art we create is relevant and that we're engaging youth and that we're thinking hard, long and hard 
about who we work with and what we put on our stages and in our spaces and broadening that as much as possible. Um, I think that's really important to keep us alive and relevant and exciting for the audiences we have now and for the audiences we want to reach in the future. Brilliant. All three of you, thank you. Uh, Nina, I wanted to talk with you a bit about some of the uh, data from the COVID cultural impact study, which you're well aware of, highlighted some inequities around the funding of BIPOC-led and BIPOC-centric and smaller organizations. So what are those barriers that we're seeing to funding that can be dismantled or reduced, and how do we get at that? Love your thoughts on that. And uh, Nina, will you take that question? Sure. Thanks, Kate. Um, I, uh, I took some notes because I was thinking about this uh, for a while. And, and the three things that come to mind, one are uh, when you talk about what are the barriers to funding and how do they need to be dismantled, like we have to recognize the historic inequities and the the cultural norms that have standardized the under-resourcing of BIPOC-led and smaller organizations. Like this is not something that was a result of the pandemic. It has been a part of our structure as a sector and as a country. Um, and we have to understand the implications for those historic inequ inequities and what they mean. Um, and I think that there has been a lack of continued education for managers and leaders within organizations and not just around critical race theory. I think that that is its own topic, but in general, how do we create healthy and sustainable organizations? Um, and then how do we like another barrier is just like, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, maybe I'll get some flack for this, but there is this accepted upward failure for white organizations and institutions and this demonization that happens for BIPOC led uh, and marginalized communities that any mistake that is made is an indication that you are not ready or capable of stewarding large investments. Um, and I think that the idea of trust based, trust based philanthropy. So the idea that whether it's money coming from a private institution, government, um, that the idea that the organizations that you're investing in, they are the most equipped to do the work, right? I think regardless of the organizational structure or size, we if you've ever done fundraising or been inside, we all have had to deal with sometimes those funders that wanna dictate what needs to happen with money rather than trusting the organizations whose missions um, need to be invested in. Um, so, and there are examples of this happening. I think the Creative Equity Fund, which was a multi-organizational partnership between Seattle Foundation, Arts Fund, Office of Arts and Culture, Satterberg Foundation, um, and private philanthropists who came together to create a fund that was designed to support uh, BIPOC organizations and to support the efforts that they have and trust them to do the work. So it's also, it's not anything that's new or sexy or things that we don't know. Um, it's the, but it does require a lot of really hard work and a lot of uh, dealing with um, <laughs> like our, our own bullshit, honestly. Uh, I, I said I was gonna try not to swear, but there we go, swear word number one. Um, <laughs> and also like the idea that unrestricted funding, like operational support, like is the best type of support that organizations can receive because anything that comes with the restriction ultimately creates a set of barriers for the institution to do the work that they need. So that like, those are the thoughts that come to mind is like, we have to reckon with the historic implications for why BIPOC organizations have historically been underinvested in. Um, and then there are simple, easy steps that involve like cross sectoral collaboration that I think could lead us towards a future where all boats rise. So those are my thoughts. Whew. Great, thank you, Nina. Um, because we have some limited time here, I'm going to, uh, while digesting what Nina was just talking about, move on to David. And David, you have been a leader of extraordinary work for in the cultural sector for some time. So as you read the cultural COVID cultural impact study and, and digested all of it, um, what stood out for you as new findings that are most notable 
And what is the opportunity for us all around these findings? Thank you, Kate. Um, you know, I think the, the screaming headline of this report is that this is not a temporary situation. This is not a speed bump that we're going to simply uh, endure and move forward as we always have. This is a transformational time, as uh, Sarah said at the beginning, we have to evolve, transform, or close. Uh, as Amy said a minute ago, we have to focus on our relevancy. And as Nina was just saying, the issues of equity, I think, uh, for me at least, are some of the greatest opportunities to help us find our way in change and building that relevancy. That that equity is both internal work that we have to do within our organizations, our staff, our boards, our mission, our vision, our values, those pieces all need to be screened through a new understanding of how we're gonna stand up and deliver equity across the community. That then will evolve into engaging our audiences and our community in completely different ways. To me, that is going to be a wonderful uh, new platform for diversification of revenues. Now I'm kind of jumping from the ethical and moral position into the business position. I think that equity is going to diversify how we can think about our revenues. And that means we have to, in many ways, um, uh, segment and understand who we're talking to and how to engage them with relevance in different pockets, if you will, different groups of audience by age, by uh, backgrounds, uh, by region are going to respond to different kinds of work. We need to be nimble enough to meet them where they are, energize them, engage them in that relevant work uh, and, uh, you know, benefit from the, the partnership by bringing an audience to art. Um, I think that thinking of it that way is like thinking of your stock portfolio and, you know, they stay strong through diversity. And that's where I think the integrity of focusing on equity is going to come together in a really, really powerful way for all of us. So I'm hoping that this is the opportunity for all of us to rethink our case, to accelerate the pace. Uh, of change so that we can meet the tastes and the needs and the format of the next generation because we can't be looking in the rearview mirror. You know, we can't do what we've always done. Same as last year, that old accounting term, not so good. So it's time to pick mm -hmm. up, be nimble yeah. and move. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, David. Uh, Amy, as you well know, one of the five recommendations from the study is around centering the cultural sector more squarely in economic development strategies, something very near and dear to my heart. As a major employer at the fifth of local cultural er workers and performing artists in the region, how do you foresee this work unfolding and how can it include organizations of all sizes and scales? Uh, thanks for that question. I think, you know, to start off with, I want to say that we know this is a long haul recovery right now. Um, when we, some of the survey information was really good at telling us respondents expect to spend half as much as they did prior to the pandemic. That's pretty scary for those of us who rely on earned income and who are coming out of the last couple years um, with a lot of great COVID relief money, but see that drying up. That was talked about in some of the case studies as well. And I think we need to collectively, the groups here are, with arts funds help. I know Manny from Inspire Washington is talking to us later about cultural access, but I feel like arts and cultural organizations need to work inclusively, equitably together on really um, getting higher public funding at all levels. You know, for the Fifth Avenue Theater before COVID, less than 1% of our income was from public funding. And, that, and we got income from the city and the county and the state and the feds, and it was 
half a percent of all of our income that drastically changed during COVID when we when we were lucky enough um, to receive PPP and SPOG money. But we're one of those organizations that has a big staff that has full time financial people, you know, during COVID that has uh, a grant writer like me that has all kinds of resources to spend because it was a heavy, heavy lift. These applications, they were not designed with equity in mind. Right. And so um, so thinking about public funding collectively together, moving forward and advocating for it with a real equity lens. I mean, the things that Nina were, was talking about earlier, where we we're decreasing barriers to entry, where we're being trust based, where we're um, really seeking operating and unrestricted funds, the things that we as organizations know we really need to survive and thrive moving forward. So I think, you know, advocating together for public funding is part of it. And the other thing I would say is there are lots of things we can do individually so that they would help individual employers and employees. So things like the uh, employer retention tax credit, which expired at the end of 2021, but I know for many organizations was incredibly helpful and provided up to 26,000 in relief per person. Like that is a huge deal. So extending um, that kind of thing into the future, into 2022 and beyond. Um, and other ideas like student loan forgiveness and individual tax credits for nonprofit arts and cultural workers, things that would really help individual workers. Um, and there's so many things like there's a long list. There's some of them in the report, but there's so many things that can also be aimed at individuals. So it doesn't matter where they work. If we can define arts and cultural nonprofit workers and really help them individually stay in the sector and thrive, I think that would be really great, too. Thank you. It is nothing short of astonishing that the fifth had 1% of their funding as public funding before the pandemic. Um, so glad to see not only King County, but other public funders coming in to change that. But how do we sustain it? How do we leverage the COVID cultural impact study to sustain public support going forward? Love your thoughts on that, any of you. I think one thing that comes to my mind is somehow sharpening our storytelling and making it absolutely clear that the work that we do is about social cohesion. It is about the whole of our community and holding a center as a convener, as an inspiration source for our community to come together and be whole to the degree that we can. And that to me is the vital piece. Now there's some cognitive dissonance that we have to confront with our donors and uh, elected officials because they will respond by saying, yes, great, agree. And yet there's this gap where the investment is not following. So somehow we have to get over that cognitive dissonance and connect between where we know their hearts are into action. Not exactly sure how to get there. I will add to that that I think they're the great thing that this report and many reports that are going to come out out of this as we analyze what the impact was is that we have concrete data to support what we all know anecdotally, right? It's very hard to ignore that I have it pulled up next to me just because it like I have two screens and why not? Um, but it's very hard to ignore that drop in revenue that organizations have experienced. And it's equally hard to ignore the fact that so many organizations were able to make it through because of that infusion of public support, right? Like that is a concrete argument and a, and a presentation of facts that are irrefutable. And when I think about how to use it as an engagement tool, so before For Culture, I worked at CD Forum, and before that at the Opera doing fundraising. So for any of the fundraisers or frontline staff that, that are on this call, like this is an engagement tool, right? This is a chance for you to take this report and send it to like maybe the top 10 or 20 people in your portfolio, right? Of like, hey, this has come out in the sector. I think it's really important. And then you follow up with conversation. And then I think this one supportive action that the organization can do is like get everybody reacquainted with what does advocacy in our sector mean? I think David 
said it well, and he continues to say it really well, like our ability to tell our collective story hinges on us being able to tell a collective story, right? We have to be on the same page around what are the concerns? What are the issues? If we can't tell that as a body, then people that are in positions of power, be they electeds, be they the heads of major philanthropic organizations at the national level, as well as the regional level, they're never going to hear it. And so I think that that is gonna be the opportunity. Really solid, thank you, Nina. Any thoughts, Amy? Anything you wanted to add? I, I would agree with what I do with David and Nina said. I mean, I think that um, us being able to tell our individual and collective stories well is really important. Being able to talk about the difference that we make, being able to talk about the value of arts and culture, both for and of itself, is, respondents, you know, talked about that it makes them happy, brings them joy, that they love experiencing art. We can get lost sometimes in the economic side of things, which is also important, but also to be able to talk and show the value that people feel uh, when they experience art firsthand. And also, though, the economic impact, the fact that we drive people, that we drive tourists, that we bring workers into the region, that, you know, the money that we spend paying workers, has an incredible ripple effect and that the arts and cultural workforce is huge as a percentage of the state. Um, so I think, you know, we have a lot of data that can also help us support our case for the investment in the arts, but really framing the arts as a public good, because I don't think it's framed that way now. And I think that's really part of our story that we really do provide a public good that should have public resources attached. Thank you. Let me just say, Kate, one of the amazing things that happened out of the pandemic was cross-sector uh, advocacy at the federal level. And that's something I hope we don't walk away from. I think we need to stay absolutely connected with our brethren in the for-profit realm, in yes. films and nightclubs and all of that, because it was through the power of that cross-sector communication and advocacy that we burst through and got people to understand. Pre-pandemic, arts and culture was 4% of GDP in this country. That's bigger than transportation, that's bigger than agriculture, oh my goodness. And yet, we have never really told that story. We've never broken through. So this is the opportunity and I hope we don't, we don't um, walk away from the relationships that we built during the pandemic. Ah, oh, so good. I could not agree more. And thank you all. Thank you to all of our panelists. Um, we are going to move on now to Vivian, who is going to talk with us a bit about next steps. Yeah, and I will jump in while Vivian is getting onto the screen. Thank you, Kate, and thank you, Amy, Nina, and David. Um, Amy, Nina, and David, you are welcome to stay on screen. Vivian's just gonna speak for a few minutes and then all of us will remain here for the open Q&A, including myself and Kate. Um, for the COVID Cultural Impact Study, Arts Fund was grateful for the opportunity to work not only with a phenomenal advisory body, four of whom are, were on the screen moments ago, but also with a team of consultants. Um, we worked with Dr. William Byers from the University of Washington, Don Morgan and GMA Research, and Vivian Sabbath and Burke Consulting. Um, Burke and Vivian were the primary consultants on the study and Vivian was the study's author. We are thrilled to have her here today um, to share some of her thoughts and takeaways um, and some framing for what might come next. Uh, and then following Vivian's remarks, we will all remain on the screen for the broader Q&A. So please attendees feel free to un um, camera hide yourselves and put your questions in the chat. Thanks, Vivian. Thanks so much, Sarah. Good morning, everyone. My name is Vivian Sabbath. I'm an associate principal at Burt Consulting. My pronouns are she, her. I'm Chinese and Laotian American woman with dark hair, and today I'm wearing a brown sweater. So Burke is a Seattle-based public policy consulting firm, and we've been working in the Pacific Northwest for over 35 years. And we have this unique consulting role that touches housing, education, land use planning, what have you, all throughout the region. And over time, you start to develop this view of the region as, a, as an ecosystem. 
And I personally also happen to be a mushroom forager. So if you hunt for morels around here, you know that wildfires are, are destructive, but they also don't signal the death of an ecosystem. They clear the way for new things to grow. And those new things could be seeds or shrubs that would have been previously shaded out. And, and this is the metaphor that really comes to mind when I'm asked to think about the moment that we're in and the opportunities that lay before us for rebalancing the ecosystem. So we're thinking about what plants to nurture or where to invest in the region. And I'm really excited to be starting off an arts and culture recovery planning effort with the Puget Sound Regional Council that explicitly builds off of the findings in Arts Fund's COVID cultural impact study with a specific focus on understanding what's happening with the cultural workforce and where to go from here. So there's a lot more to come, but just as a quick preview of themes, I think a lot of these echo what came out through the panel. These are the types of things that we're thinking about when we're talking about recovery planning and strategies. So one is that, that theme of the collective story. If you want regional economic recovery, start with arts and culture. There are recent empirical studies from the Great Recession and recently from Australia's COVID funding spending showing that arts and culture is one of the highest leveraged public investments you can make for economic recovery, more so than construction, for example, because creativity self starts. Of course, that depends on keeping creative workers here in the region and really being able to demonstrate equity and inclusivity if you're making that case for public investment. But really kind of flipping that narrative and showing how high of a leverage we can have Cross-sector partnership, another theme we're hoping to pull out and get more concrete on. Across healthcare, arts and culture, education, the many public sectors where we work, there are things that everyone can get behind that are also lifelines for economic development. So I'm talking about broadband access, middle and lower income housing and transportation access. We, we all need it no matter what sector you're in and it's huge for economic recovery. Um, and then again, echoing some themes, just this idea of normalizing flexibility in the interface with audiences and workforces, relearning how people want to spend their money and time. And people are being flexible and just in time with some of those choices. So how do we stay relevant, not only in the content, but also modes of delivery, modes of accessing information and connecting to opportunities to participate in the arts. So I will be reaching out to many of you for this planning effort, um, but please do contact me if you want to stay in, more in touch about that effort or to get more involved. And I will drop my email in the chat here. Thanks so much, Sarah. Thank you, Vivian. Um, we were also honored to have the opportunity to work with Vivian and Burke on Arts Fund's social impact study. And I think a lot of the themes um, that, that she was just touching upon uh, a lot of the research has continued in those themes in terms of arts as a public good across these sectoral intersections. Um, and we really look forward to supporting this work with PSRC. Um, so now we are to the part of the program that is the broader Q&A where we invite all of you, the cultural partners in attendance to submit your questions in the chat. Um, while those are coming in, I'm gonna kick us off with one um, and any of you or all of you panelists and Kate um, can answer them. Uh, oh, I think, um, Nina, you mentioned a comment about using the report as an engagement tool. Um, and Amy, you also talked about your role as a fundraiser. And I'm, I'd love to hear what you think, you know, what are some, we have staff and boards here with us today. What are some of the new conversations with donors, individual donors, um, and, or, and or potentially foundations um, and corporate donors uh, that you think we can be having and that you think we need to be having? Um, I know, David, in the past, you've talked about, um, you know, the, the recommendation in the study about supporting adaptation and survival um, and some funding ideas around that. I wonder maybe if you could kick us off um, on that thread and then we could just go a little bit in this direction. Well, just as Vivian was saying about needing to, um, and as I was saying earlier, needing to stay nimble you know, my organization is looking at, okay, what, what does it mean for us to get out of our buildings, out into the community, engaging in new venues, 
what are the tools that we need uh, to do that? Is that portable stages? Is that bleachers? Is that a tent? Is that um, smaller, you know, flexible uh, performance resources so that we can get out into the community? So we're looking at, okay, yeah, we, we do want to do that. We do have the capacity to do that, but how are we going to capitalize and, and get that done without, at a time of constraint, robbing Peter to pay Paul, right? So I don't want to undermine my general operating revenues either. So how do we do that? Those are some of the big questions that, that I'm wrestling with. I also think that those kinds of questions will take us to the answer about where the next generation wants to be met. Do they want to be met in a fixed seat theater for, I know I'm focusing on performance, that's kind of what I do, so sorry about that. But um, do they really want to be in a fixed seat venue pointed in one direction for two to three hours? I don't know, I think we have to engage that question and really, confront how we might respond. I'm not sure if that's what you wanted, Sarah, but that's where my head went, so. And are you talking about risk capital there? To a certain extent, I'm, I'm talking about risk capital and uh, infrastructure investment, not necessarily bricks and mortar, but infrastructure that is gonna deliver flexibility so that we can, in a sense, be mobile and meet our audience where they're at. Uh, demanding that our audiences come to us, I think is an eroding platform. And I think we will always keep it. We'll always wanna be able to do performances in our wonderful venues, but we have to broaden the portfolio to be able to meet and generate new relationships where people are at. That's my belief. I think I'll at like speaking to, you know, this res it's a resource now, right? This report, this study is a resource. It's an opportunity to open up conversation. Um, and I guess my 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 mind always returns to the fact that we all live in this system, like this set, like call it the nonprofit industrial complex, call it the arts and cultural sector, but it's a system that has operated in a very particular way for a very long time. It has not worked the same for all of us for lot, like lots of reasons. We have had an incredibly like visceral experience that has interrupted all facets of that. And my fear is that the lessons that we have learned that have been laid at our feet, um, that this study does a good job of highlighting and giving concrete uh, information about that we will ignore them in favor of continuing the status quo because it's what feels good, because it's what's comfortable. And I think exactly what David said is that in order to meet the new generation, and new generation does not mean necessarily Gen Zers. The new generation are working professionals that have decided to leave their tech jobs that they've been in for 15 years, realize they're unhappy and they're ready for a new shift. The new generation are gonna be the same people in the same orgs that want to transition to other parts of the company. And those people are gonna come having been affected by this massive visceral event. And if we do not pay attention to I think the economic impacts that we all have experienced, but the social impacts, the moral impacts that we will continue to spin our wheels and then we're gonna miss the point. And the point I think is change and discomfort. Like we grow in those things. Like you cannot change and it be a comfortable process. Old paradigms are gonna die. Old ways of being are gonna go away. That's not bad. I think when Vivian talked about the mushroom farming, there's a book, isn't it called like the mushroom at the end of the lane or something, or that talks about like the proliferation of what happens in the face of disaster. So I think that taking the, the like the what could be, what is possible and having this report be one of many resources and tools to me is gonna be the way forward. So, oh, go ahead. 
I was just going to add a little bit of um, my optimism and hope to what Nina said, because, you know, one of the some of the series of questions within the report was about whether or not organizations were moving to focus more on BIPOC voices in the work that they were doing. And the numbers are pretty compelling, especially for large organizations, especially for non BIPOC led or BIPOC identifying organizations and then 92% of them said these changes were going to be permanent and working inside a predominantly white organization. You may not see what's on the inside of an organization, but as somebody who does, I can tell you that it's been transformational over the last year and a half and at least at the Fifth Avenue and I'm not trying to like, but I, we have made incredible changes to how we are who we're hiring, what shows we're doing, how we're investing in new musicals, and who we're investing in, very intentional, and baking it into the system. Because I think that's what's important, right? Like making systemic change and institutional change in policies and practices and who shows up. And I think that I do have some hope based on my own personal experience and how folks responded to the survey that there might actually be some real lasting change that's kind of baked into our organizations. And I just hope it it stays because it seems really great right now for some of us. I just want to chime in on one other theme and that is, um, you know, uh, our couches are really comfortable. And we have really settled in as a culture with streaming and, you know, our own creature comforts around us to pierce through that and to energize people to change that habit that is now become ingrained is going to be extremely challenging. And we have to find the, the program and the engagement story that totally different and, and transformative in its energy and its opportunity to reconnect in real live time. It's, I don't think it's gonna be the same old thing. It's got to really uh, show our communities that we're moving in a new direction. I don't have the answer for that right now, but that's what I'm seeking. And that's uh, what I hope to discover and my team hopes to discover. Thanks, David. Hey, I just want to invite the audience to jump in with questions here. Is there something you want our panelists to address or we want to have conversation about? We have a few minutes left for, for this part of the program. So if you have questions, please put them in there. Um, and one did come in um, from Vladimir. I don't know, Vladimir, if you are still with us and want to come on screen uh, to ask your question about um, community engagement. Hi, um, I just wanted, uh, it was specific to something that Amy was saying about um, kind of creating new, new ways of it, engaging audiences. And then um, Kate later, later kind of introduced the same question, but I was just wondering if there's uh, any like practical examples or thoughts about uh, both increasing the engagement outside of what Amy was saying about like youth, um, which I thought was really uh, like one approach. Um, and then but then also talking a little bit about what Kate was asking, uh, also, also extending that engagement into like donors. I don't know, just some practical, if anyone has anything, uh, examples that really worked for your organizations. Again, I, I think for us, it's been uh, about getting out into the community. So the engagement isn't just about the demographic of the audience you're speaking to, but it might be about the geography. Um, and uh, certainly we've used uh, virtual storytelling uh, to engage as well. I am now growing a little more challenged with virtual storytelling because it begins to be feeling more like another channel on the streaming service. And again, I, I'm trying to figure out how do we reinvent that virtual 
storytelling in a way that pierces uh, through the 5,000 options uh, on Netflix. And then the question is, okay, how do we fund that? Because it's not going to be through earned revenue. So then how do we do that? And, and what is that business structure behind that? These are some of the other millions of questions. What a good panelist. No answers, but lots of questions. Well, David, I think you did kind of answer this a little bit before too, which is kind of getting outside of our, our brick and mortar buildings, right? Like, I mean, forging partnerships or being in other community spaces and not always expecting people to come to us um, and having real conversations about how you can serve communities. I know that some of our, I, I'm going back to the youth engagement because that's what we are better at right now. And we are also doing more community engagement, but you know, we go into schools and create residencies with the teachers there to give the teachers the support they need because they don't have the arts funding, you know, necessary to create the program. So the fifth is going in, you know, providing free programming. And we're not just saying, here's what we're doing for you. We're working it out with the teachers and the schools to give them what they want and need and don't have access to. So I feel like having those real conversations with communities that you're hoping and wanting to serve and partner with is really important. And then getting outside of your own space to do it. Um, yeah. Uh, I would add like, this is not the sexy or the fun answer, but I think it's the um, I'm, I'm currently teaching a communications class at, uh, and it's communications for arts leaders, which is a very ubiquitous title for at Seattle University. And the thing that I'm finding and the resources I'm using is that so much of the engagement, be it donors, volunteers, um, internal staff, is that organizations do not have a clear communications plan. Like that, like from a nuts and bolts, like who are we trying to reach? Why? What is that messaging? Are our internal teams and systems on the same page about that? The strategies that you employ, there's a million of them. And you're going to go through an experiment if your organization has the culture for experimentation and trying things out. The strategies that you use for the different groups that you want to engage with, I think ultimately don't really matter because you're going to find the one that works. But it's I, what I am finding is, and I'm seeing this in my own work and I reflect back on it on my times that I worked at CD Forum and when I worked at the opera, is that even pre-pandemic, the times where I think we, I have fell short as a fundraiser or as a member of a team or seen my department fall short is when our strategy about who we are, what we're trying to, what we are wanting people to take action on, and then what we offer has not been clear. And I think maybe that's, when I think about the infrastructure investments, David mentioned this earlier, that it's not always going to be like um, like nuts and bolts. Sometimes it's inf like it's going to be your software. It's going to be like, is your is MailChimp the thing you need to be using? I think that there's an opportunity to re-examine those internal systems and just make sure everybody is on the same page. Because I think it can be very surprising that depending on your position, you as the ED may be very clear what your message is and you tell that to the board. But if your person that manages your annual fund campaign is not actually on board with that and hasn't been communicating that with your donors, you're not in simpatico. So I think that there's an opportunity just to like, honestly, take it back to the basics and figure out like, what the hell are we all trying to do and why? And then throw in the issues of doing that during the pandemic and it's all a party. Um, but yeah, that's what it makes me think of. Thank you, Nina. And swear number two, or did I miss one? Uh, we have a question that has come in from Robert Alexander from the Arts West Board. Robert, do you want to come on screen and ask your question? It's a really great question. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Yeah, I was, you know, some of the recommendations indicated we ought to work harder on developing more federal funds for the arts, which is a wonderful idea. But I look at the political situation and kind of realistically think about past funding for the arts prior to the pandemic. And it seems like it's really, maybe not really a really good investment of our effort to try to influence the federal government to try to maintain or, or increase the kind of funding that we've had. Do you think it's worth it? Well, I will say that, um... I think to 
as much as I fall prey to this thinking too, Robert, uh, uh, showing up with a predetermined um, belief of how various leaders are going to respond um, never works out particularly well. And I was surprised to see how much um, bipartisan support there was for the federal relief program around the arts, particularly led by Senator Cornyn in Texas. So I think this is all incumbent on us to tell the right story, to tell it robustly, to get advocacy behind us. And I guess I still have faith that uh, people will listen and do the right thing uh, as they did at the peak of the pandemic. I think it's a moment. I think it's a moment for us to keep that focus, including with the federal government, because um, their awareness has been raised throughout the pandemic. We have seen levels of support unforeseen before, and the what's believed to be the first ever congressional hearing on the creative economy happened recently. So all of these things, if we can elevate them, and I, I think Manny will be speaking about some of the other federal bills that are in play, but it's a good time to keep focus, in my opinion, and keep the government realizing the impact of the cultural sector, which has largely been unrealized through much of our history, and let them know that arts are essential, culture is essential, we must keep it as we move forward. So that's my two cents. Yeah, I know we're probably going to move on, but I, if anybody knows Kevin Hughes, who is like a lot like I'm saying head shakes. He was my uh, policy and government teacher in my program. And I have little Kevin on my shoulders whispering in my ear that when I, to your question, Robert, that it also starts locally. And I think that that like what this has shown us is that any of the things that have been moved forward with the federal packages getting far, it started because people were in communication with their local electeds, right? It started because they didn't, uh, go to town hall meetings demanding money uh, for stuff before having conversations. So I think maybe that's also a part of the moment that David is talking about is that we have this chance to engage with this system that we all bought into because we're American citizens and we said, yep, this is what I, this is what I agree to and participating in that system and arts and cultural issues tend to be the most bipartisan issues that tend to get passed with like whenever I've seen bills come across. So there's, I think there's a lot of, we have good things working in our corner, but it, I think recognizing the importance of that local engagement and making sure that it doesn't begin with going to Congress, Senate, whatever, but it's like, who are city council people? Who are the folks that are here? And also what are those other cross-sectoral initiatives that we can put our weight behind and support because it benefits us, the broadband issue that Vivian talked about, the housing, right? If none of this city or the county or the state is affordable, we're not gonna have creative people, we're not gonna have doctors, we're not gonna have anybody that wants to be here. So I think that's like little Kevin Hughes is telling me like it has to start with the local before we advance to this like idea of federal investment. I think we have to challenge our leaders to the better angels uh, of who we are and that we have that story to tell better than almost anybody else. We bring the better angels forward. We have time for one more question, which Kate is going to ask, but I will say the answer to this or this discussion will continue because following that question, we're going to um, open the, give the floor to Manny Qualling of Inspire Washington, who will no doubt have further inspiration um, as well as very tactical tips on how we can engage both our local and federal leaders in expanding this support. Um, Kate. Excellent. Uh, so last question for our panelists. Um, what's a trend that you are seeing right now that you find compelling for the sector to pay attention to? You gotta unmute, Nina. <laughs> I don't know. 
You'd think after 12 years on Zoom, that's what it feels like. Um, the thing that immediately came to mind is the number of individual artists who were demanding support for process and, uh, and creation over product. Like I have had personally a lot of artist friends who are um, finding funding, who are trying to make that a priority that it's not just about the product that they make, the, the show that goes up on stage, but that there's actual time to create and experiment and heal. And I, I love that one, that the ask is there, but also that there's money starting to be put behind that. Some of it is through crowdfunding campaigns where individual artists who are just on top of their stuff are requesting money to support projects that are at the beginning stages of their iteration. And I hope that that's something that becomes more of a trend and that we see more institutionalized support for process and, uh, and experimentation for individual artists um, rather than only focusing on you must produce a product or uh, have an end result. Excellent. I, I love that answer. I, I'm going to piggyback on it a little bit. I think at least at the Fifth Avenue and at other theaters, um, we look long and hard at We See You White American Theater as really a clarion call to treat artists better, um, to respect their physical and mental health and well-being. And some of that really is exactly what Nina's saying, like making the process better, changing the rehearsal week schedule. So days are shorter and they're not as many days of the week that you're working. That's a process change that makes everybody better. You know, having more understudies, paying actors and writers and creatives for their time in the room and not just, for example, when we commission new writers, not just having them get a commission, but paying them when they're actually in the rehearsal room, when they're in the reading room, when they're participating in the process. So I feel like um, bigger organizations are having that aha moment just as people are demanding it, it appropriately. I think we're realizing, oh, geez, we need to do that. And that's something that's been missing. So I do think that there have been a lot of internal changes, a lot of organizations that help all actors that might have been um, started with We See White American Theater, but are helping everybody kind of have a better experience in the creative economy. And I'll just chime in and say, um... A different trend uh, that I'm seeing is exhaustion among staff, and um, I think we uh, in the field need to step into that, do some uh, TLC and healing. That may mean uh, I don't know what it means. I, I'm looking at uh, creating some special events for my staff now that we hopefully are going to be able to meet in person and just do some let's have some fun time and start to rebuild those relationships that have been put into brady bunch boxes so that's one of the things i'm looking at thank you david um that is a great segue to hopefully one day we will convene with all of you uh, the cultural partners network and you with all of one another also out of these boxes i really look forward to that day um I cannot thank the panelists, uh, Nina, Amy, and David enough um, for sharing your thoughts this morning and Kate for ushering us through this very um, provocative discussion um, and conversation, uh, I, which I hope um, will continue outside of this room amongst all of the participants who are here today within your organizations, your staffs, your boards, your constituents, and more, um, as well as you with us at Arts Fund. Um, you will shortly be hearing from our president and CEO, Michael Greer, who will be closing us out. Um, but I really cannot thank, again, the panelists um, and Kate for your leadership today and throughout the, the conducting of this study, as well as Vivian um, for your, your instrumental work on bringing this to fruition. Um, so it is now, please join me in giving them a round of silent uh, hands and applause, thank you. Um, it is now my great honor um, to invite Manny Kowaling, Executive Director of Inspire Washington, to just share a few minutes of his thoughts, um, essentially in Advocacy 101. What can we do now? What can we do next? Um, we've touched upon this in a number of the questions that arose today. Um, and Manny, please um, tell us what you're thinking. Hello, friends. So good to see you. And thank you so much for Arts Fund for doing this important work. And 
um, and hosting this event. Um, so what do we do next? Uh, I wanna talk to you about what uh, some core ingredients about uh, for advocacy. Uh, yes, we have the CCIS data and that data is important uh, because it helps our decision makers, our lawmakers, our city leaders, our county leaders to make decisions, to prioritize, right? It highlights an issue, but your cultural story personalizes it. A really good example of this during the very beginning of the pandemic, when we were pulling at Inspire Washington uh, congressional meetings together, I remember one of our first meetings was with Representative Derek Kilmer, uh, you know, one of Washington State's congressional members. And when he heard that in his hometown in Port Angeles, that the Juan de Fuca Arts Festival was being canceled, you saw him catch his breath. That was personal to him. So again, the CCIS data is your foundation. It provides a context. It really illustrates a big and broad story. Lawmakers need to hear that. Decision makers need to hear that because that's how they prioritize and they have lots of issues on their plate. But your, your cultural story, what's happening in your organization, how it affects your programs and your community, your, ser your services, your employees, that personalizes it, that tugs at the heartstrings. Data and heartstrings. Uh, make for really good advocacy. And of course, right now, there's the urgency of right now, today's challenges. You know, the study is really great data for them and it is relevant and it is from last year, but you also get to have the power of urgency. What is happening today, this month, because of Omicron, right? There's a lot of new factors that are, you know, this, the, the pandemic has, uh, there's like a new spin every month. <laughs> And um, uh, so you really get to tell about the urgency of this moment and why you may need support um, uh, from uh, your city or your county or the state. Uh, so there's a new layer that drives your meeting. And let's talk about who you can outreach to. Advocacy, I encourage you right now to advocate to your elected officials. Who represents you in the state, in the county, in the city? Uh, and also within your members of Congress. All of these elected officials in our representative government are there to work on your behalf. Um, and they also are sitting on a tremendous amount of resources. You saw that earlier in the CCIS data, how important public support was, and we've been talking about it already. Um, so uh, they hold resources that you could use. And why? Why do you need all this? Because you are going to champion a, a request. You're gonna ask for something, but I encourage you to think about it this way. You're not asking for charity. You are asking your elected officials to invest in your community. We know that an investment in creative and cultural economy has far reaching impact, right? So you are helping your representative do their job. Um, and I think that that's the way to frame it. And I think there is also unique situations in this pandemic. I know that uh, in the past, um, it, when you, uh, in advocating for something, you had to bring that, uh, that member, that elected official, you had to provide them with so much context, you had to paint a story, you had to create a world for them. What I've learned today, uh, a lot of those conversations happen a lot faster because we all are living in the same world. They understand that your business has been shut down for a long period of time. They understand uh, that industries have lost tremendous amount of employees, that there's a brain drain. These are all things that they understand. So I think that it's gonna allow you to get to the heart of the matter a lot quicker. We also believe and we know that in our representative government, um, many voices, a chorus is powerful. So at Inspire Washington, we champion voices from very different disciplines and you can do the same thing. It is your voice as a staff member. It is the voices of your board. It is the voices of your supporter. And when we work together as a statewide cultural coalition, it's the voices representing every one of our 39 counties, every one of our 49 state legislative districts. There are a number of critical opportunities right now within the state legislative session, which ends on March 10th. Um, if you'd like to learn more about the um, uh, about all the specific requests, uh, just email uh, Madeline at Inspire Washington. That's advocacy at inspirewashington.org. <clears throat> 
and she can uh, share with you our Google Drive that we've been sharing with advocates uh, that has all the briefing sheets and all the talking points, and perhaps you have advocated already, and we are grateful. It's not too late. So where are we in the session? We have all of these great bills, right, that are at play. Um, and they will play out as long as they meet all the cutoff deadlines. There are deadlines paced out through the legislative session, uh, but the budget requests play out and build momentum to the very end when that legislation is passed. And there's a tremendous amount of money that we've been asking for. There is $25 million that Inspire Washington advocated and secured in the last legislative session, but there was a there was a problem with some of the words that in the legis legislation is law and in law words matter. So the legislation is cleaning up that language so they can distribute those funds. In addition, ArtsWA has uh, been championing over the past year, a request that the governor included in his proposed supplemental budget of $20 million. So now we're at 45. Um, and we are hoping the legislature keeps that in the budget. The governor proposes it the legislature, the keepers of the purse, they're going to finalize the budget. Uh, so all of those funds are important. So that's $45 million. The only requirements that we've heard of thus far is that, that those funds would be equitably distributed throughout the entire state. They are for cultural organizations with missions and uh, nonprofits with, in, with missions in uh, science, heritage, and the arts. The maximum grant award is 80000 and those grants and those funds are for organizations with budgets of $5 million or less. Additionally, because of the tremendous reopening costs of some of our larger cultural uh, institutions, there is $15 million that the uh, legislature will consider to pay for COVID-related expenses, those, those um, public health roles that organizations are now playing um, in testing uh, performers and things like that. So that's a total of $60 million. We need your help to advocate for all of those funds um, because uh, there are a lot of priorities in Washington state. And one thing that we know within the government space, there may be money today, there may not be an opportunity tomorrow. So we've got to, to, to get that support now. Um, I urge you all to go to the Washington state legislature website um, just Google that and, uh, and click on District Finder. If you don't know who represents you, find out who represents you. Jesse's going to drop inside the chat uh, a document so that you can see who's on the House Appropriations Committee because that is the chamber that we're really focused on right now. There's also a tremendous amount of federal legislative opportunities. Inspire Washington will be talking more about that in March. All focus is on the state, but we're particularly interested uh, in the Creative Economy Revitalization Act, uh, because we know that artists, artists for their own unique creative work have not uh, been served like many others uh, through federal relief. So um, that would provide $300 million for creative work. Couple top line things I want you to know about cultural access in King County, since there's a lot of King County partners here. Inspire Washington was reformed as Inspire Washington. You may have remembered us as an organization called Cultural Access Washington, but we were reformed in 2019 with a real emphasis on community development. We learned in the 17 campaign in King County uh, that speaking about our industry sustainability, although very important, and that drives community growth, is not the way that the community really wants to understand our work. They wanna know what we are doing for them. Cultural access legislation was amended in 2020. Some of you may remember the campaign uh, in 2017 and some of the problematic funding formulas. We amended that. It actually became final March 5th of 2020. I sat on my couch, I watched it from the TV. I was so excited to tell you a story. I wrote a great email to say, we did this together. This is what people asked for. I held on that email because the next week you were shutting your doors and that was not the kind of story that you were ready for right now, but at that time. But we did amend the law. An effort is underway to determine our capacity, our capacity, the sector's capacity for a 2022 campaign. But to secure that transformative public investment, it will require a united effort of the entire cultural sector in King County. Are you ready? Are we ready? 
Uh, last, in 2017, we mounted a campaign uh, that was about $1.5 million. We have the ambition to do that this year, but we're going to have to ask ourselves if we're ready to really, uh, if we can deliver that and if we can win this year, because um, cultural access is not something we can try every year. But I sure hope so. Uh, and we're going to be talking more about that later. And then um, please register for the Inspiration League. It's how we drive lots of emails to lawmakers, inspirationleague.org. We will need a lot of emails during the budget uh, uh, part, the end budget during the state legislative session to say, yes, we thank you. We got all the funding we, we wanted. Or to say, why did you not include our funding? It was important to us. Uh, so please register, get everyone you know. And of course, here's my contact information. Um, that is a tremendous amount of, of information in a short period of time, but I'm always happy to discuss that. Uh, and uh, please reach out to me and Inspire Washington. Manny, thank you so much. Um, as always, it's incredibly informative and um, I just can't wait for, for us to dig into this advocacy more. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Michael Greer and I'm president and CEO here at Arts Fund. Um, for those of you who have not seen me or met me, I am a light-skinned black man wearing uh, a blue turtleneck, glasses, and a mustache, no hair, and sitting in front of a window to my garden. I had some planned remarks for to close this out, which I will still get to, but I'm also just going to go off script a little bit and say how incredibly inspired I am that this is the future of our sector. It was so empowering for me to see the results of the work of our CCIS, to see the way that everyone was engaging with it. Um, to Amy, Nina, David, Vivian, Kate, uh, thank you so much for sharing your professional insights into all this. And I think that this, the way that this group has interacted with this data, the questions that you have asked, and the way that it is forward-looking, it's intelligent, and hopefully with our help at, at Arts Fund, it is more informed. I feel confident in the future of the sector. Um, in closing, and this gets to my prepared remarks, but uh, I, I will say that um, I did want to just say thank you to everyone, everyone that made today possible, and more broadly to everyone that keeps our missions, visions, and values alive across the state. Um, to all of our public sector partners, our corporate supporters, our community advocates, and all the practitioners that uh, thank you for support of this study, for your support of Arts Fund, and for your role in making sure that arts and culture are an equitable, accessible, and meaningful part of every Washingtonian's lives. Today, this event to me highlighted the gravity of what we've all been experiencing over the past two years. And at the same time, it has reminded us of the resilience of this sector and the permanence that it has in just literally in the human experience. These findings, they speak to an essential nature of what it is that all of you bring to our communities and the dedication that each one of you have to bringing the benefit of arts and culture to all people. So together, I look forward to reimagining this role of arts and culture and the role that it plays in our community and ensuring that its benefits are there and a part of the everyday lives of people for generations to come. So with that, I thank you very, very much for participating today and thank you for being a part of the Arts Fund family. And I'm, with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Steffi. Thank you all. Thanks, Michael. All right, everyone. Um, I just wanted to say, of course, thank you to our panelists. Thank you to Kate. Thank you to our ASL interpreters for being here and to our um, back end support staff. We also just wanna say thanks to Warner Media again for being the sponsor of this event. Thank you to the study sponsors, Bank of America with additional support from the Paul G. Allen Family Foundation and the National Family Foundation. Um, tomorrow, we will share a brief survey with you attendees, which will include um, links to access um, our resource kit that will have this PowerPoint slide deck We'll have a social media toolkit. We'll have a, a document of quotes from different cultural participants and, and other items. Um, so we really welcome you in amplifying um, these findings with us. If you have time today, please fill that survey. I think Katie put it in the chat. And with that, I just wanna say thank you to everyone again. It's, uh, it's 12 o'clock. So um, thank you all for being here today and um, we wish you all the best. Thank you. <laughs>